uh, let me have your attention here. We're going to uh, be in Genesis 32. Genesis chapter 32. We'll begin with a word of prayer here. And then we'll jump right into Genesis 32 on the life and prayers of Jacob, especially today, wrestling with God in prayer. I think it's a story we all know, but uh, we'll see if we can pull some prayer principles from Genesis 32 this evening. Let's go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. We'll jump right in. Uh, Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for the riches of your grace, how uh, there are showers of blessing that you shower upon us every day. Uh, Grace upon grace, uh, gift upon gift, you are truly um, a father who loves his children and gives us even more than we need. Lord, we thank you for your your gracious gifts that you you pour upon all of us. We thank you most of all for your son, for your spirit, and for the scriptures. Uh, give uh, Give us grace to draw near you this evening. We pray, Lord, for ourselves that we would have tender hearts willing spirits. We pray, Lord, for the teens, that they would grow in in grace and in knowledge this evening, and the same for the children. Keep them all safe. Keep them all attentive. Um, Help them to be focused on your word, and then, Lord, help us to be focused on prayer when we get into it, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so uh, Genesis 32. Um, We're continuing in the prayers from the book of Genesis, and again, we're just watching how prayer works in the lives of uh, the, the first uh, family of faith, Abraham and his children and descendants. And so we're going to be in Genesis 32. This is the section where we see that uh, Jacob wrestles with God in prayer. He has served 20 years. He has served 20 years for Laban. Remember, they cut the cord last week. He is now separated from Laban. They made a, they made a covenant to not hurt one another. Um, now, after 20 years, he's going to go look at the face of a brother who's the last time he saw, the brother wanted to kill him. Just a matter of time. Once dad dies, Esau said, once dad dies, then I will kill Jacob. And so his mother and he, uh, Rebecca. Uh, His mother and he, is it Rebecca? Yeah. Yes, it's Rebecca, his mother. They plan an escape. He's gone. And so after uh, 20 years of being gone, getting four wives and 12 sons, he's on his way back home to see this brother in whom he had stolen the birthright as well as the family blessing. So let's look at Genesis chapter 32, verse 1 and 2. And Jacob went on his way. This is after the farewell party and and sacrifice feast with uh, Laban. And Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, This is God's host. And he called the name of that place Mahanaim. So this is interesting here. I don't remember reading this from my other scripture reading from before, but on his way back, he sees an army of angels. There's a camp of angels that, that pitch their camp next to his. And again, this is a sign of God's, uh, I think this is a token of God's presence and his protection. And he even names the place. Look at what he says. Very clear in verse 2 of Genesis 32. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's host. So this is very clear. He's on his way back to go see his brother, who we think is going to kill him. He thinks there's going to be a battle. But he sees an army or a camp of angels camping next to his camp. So there ought to be some, at least, a mustard seed of faith of God's presence and protection. Because these are angels, and that's what he calls them. This is God's host, and the name Mahanim, that means two camps. So there's the camp of the angels, in his own camp, his four, four wives and kids and, and uh, servants. So Jacob's on his way. He has this communion with God. There's, present, there's the presence of the angels here. Jacob's concern is that there's going to be a battle with his brother. He wasn't thinking about reconciliation. He was thinking about, I got to be prepared for the worst. <clears throat> If he would have remembered the first time he had a dream at Bethel, do you remember what the dream was? 
we call it Jacob's, uh, Jacob's ladder. Remember, there was angels descending and ascending on Jacob's ladder. So here is God again. Angels are, are, angels are present, giving him a token of his presence, God's presence, and his protection as well. But he doesn't remind himself of that first vision and God's promise of protection and presence and provision. Now look at uh, verse 3. We'll read to verse 5 here. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau his brother unto the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, Thus shall ye speak unto my lord Esau, thy servant Jacob saith saith thus, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed there until now. And I have oxen and asses and flocks and men servants and women servants, and I have sent to tell my lord that I may find grace in thy sight. So again, the last time he saw Esau, Esau wanted to kill him. So here, he's telling his servants, I'm going to send you ahead, I'm going to send a delegation, and this is what you're going to say to Esau. I've got a lot of stuff for him. We're going to try to buy his, his or soften his anger towards me with these presents, with these gifts of livestock. That's the plan. He's frightened, and he sends this delegation, and uh, he gets some bad news here when the delegation comes back. He gets some, uh, some scary news as essentially he hears the hoofbeats of his past catching up with him. And here's the report. Look at verse 6, Genesis 32, verse 6. And the messengers returned to Jacob saying, We came to thy brother Esau, and also he cometh to meet thee, and 400 men with him. So what do you think Jacob did when he heard 400 men? You know, you don't just travel with a group of 400 men. You have a purpose if you have 400 men with you. And likely it's not, you know, a party. It's more of a war party. That's what I would think. Now look at verse 7. Then Jacob was, here's the result, greatly afraid and distressed. And he divided the people that was with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two bands and said, if Esau come to the one company and smite it, then the other company which is left shall escape. So I think personally, I think uh, Jacob is a natural leader. Everywhere he goes, something happens and people have to deal with it. Um, I think if you were a a boss or um, some type of a manager and you did the hiring, you would hire somebody like him because he gets things done. And so here... He gets the bad news, and remember, God had sent angels to camp right next to them. And some scholars believe that only Jacob could see them because they were God's angels. No one else saw them. I don't know if I could say that, but that's what he, he acknowledges. These are God's, God's hosts, these angels. And then he, it's as if he just plain for, ooh, it's raining. I'm going to let them in. You got it? Come on in. So, do you want to show them, Paul, where, where they need to go? I don't, I'm not sure if they know where they need to go. But, uh, so, here's panic setting in. There's terrifying news. 400 men. Okay. There's 400 men, and uh, he didn't learn all the lessons that he did about God at Bethel. Right? At Bethel, he forgot about the dream at Jacob's ladder. What he did remember is the nature of man, Laban. Hey, come on in. We'll show you right where to go, okay? Can you take them? Okay, that would be great. Welcome back. Okay, let me get your names again. Hey, don't tell me. Laura. Savannah. Wait, wait, wait. Michaela. Welcome back. Good to have you here. Why don't you you come over here? They'll show you where to go, okay? Okay, so... uh, Okay, where was I? (laughs) All right, uh, he's panicking. He's concerned. Um, he's, he's, he's already crafted a plan. He's got a, a plan B, a plan of escape. He is, again, I think, a natural-born leader. And so one of the problems of having natural ability is that you depend on yourself and your own craftiness. That's why he'll have to be broken. Okay, he, he's good. He's, he, he's, he's crafty. Um, in the world's eyes, and you know what? We'll talk about it when we get to it, but I think, what would you do? 
you know a brother wants to kill you, and there's 400 men that he's with heading your way. I mean, you can say you have all the faith and confidence in the world, but you can have faith in all, you know, as a, who was it? One, some general or, or some soldier who said, trust God, right? And keep the powder dry, <laughs> right? So there, there's God's part and my part. And right now, Jacob's got to make a decision because it's going to, you know, the, the heat is going to get turned on. And it's starting to boil here. So here's the question for you. Jacob is in. Hello, come on in. Is it Beth? Is it Beth? Come on in. You can go with the children or you can come on in here, whatever you would like to do, okay? Welcome back. We're in Genesis 32 if you want to sit here. <laughs> or you can go to the kids there right that way, okay? <laughs> well, you know what? Sue will come back. She'll let you know. She'll help you out. But um, So we have... A circumstance that is, is uh, difficult, there is no other way. He's not going to go back because Laban, you know, that door is shut. They've agreed, here's a watchtower between us. I won't cross here. You won't cross here. But now he's got to go forward, face his, his sins. You know what? His sins going to find him out here. So you either panic or you pray. When you're in a difficult circumstance, you can't pay the bills. Um, you can't face the consequence of a bad decision. There's this range of options. Panic, you know, you know, run around like a chicken with your head cut off. Prayer, but prayer doesn't mean you do nothing. Correct? When I counsel people, whether they're unemployed or whether there's um, family situations on, going on, husband, wife, mom, children, dad, children, I say, okay, what have you done so far? Well, I've prayed about it. The next question I ask after that statement is, what else did you do? Are you just going to pray to get the job and just sit there? Or are you going to go beat the bushes and fill out some, some, some job applications? Right? So there's that range of panic, pray, and then there's all this stuff in between. And right now we have the heat getting turned on for Jacob here. I mean, he's responsible for all these kids and all these wives. And he makes a plan. And again, I think God has already spoken to him saying, look, my angels are here. But he kind of forgets that God's protection is there. And so he protects himself. But all this is turned on. All this pressure is turned on. Now look at verse 9. It is here when he begins to pray. Verse 9, Genesis 32. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord which says unto me, Return into thy country and into thy kindred, and I will deal well with thee. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant, for with my staff I have passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children." And thou saidst, I will surely do thee good and make thy seed as the sea, sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. So again, this circumstance is causing him to go to prayer. And in this prayer, what does he do? He remembers that God has promised to his, his great-grandfather Abraham, to his father Isaac, and now he says, you are also my God. Okay, God has no grandchildren. You've got to possess it by faith yourself. And so he is, he is owning it now. He has, said, he has said, look, you told me to go back. He's using, he's praying God's word back to him. There's a prayer of uh, essentially affirmation. He reminds God that, look, you said that our, our descendants will be as the sand of the sea. So that means when I go meet my, my murderous brother who's seeking revenge and is probably going to be enraged, 
these two can't coexist. Either he's going to kill me or your promise is going to come true. We're going to have many sea, uh, descendants as much as the sand in the sea. So he reminds God of his promises. And you kind of, you got to ask, did Isaac tell a lot of stories about Abraham's faith? Did Isaac tell, or tell Jacob what he learned from Abraham about when Abraham had the three visitors come down before Sodom and Gomorrah? Remember, God came down, wanted to know what's going on. He heard the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah. And so there was a theophany in the life of Abraham, God in the flesh, the pre-incarnate Christ. So I think Jacob may have heard those stories from grandpa and dad, Isaac. So that's going to come into play here. So he affirms the faith. He says essentially back in verse 10, Look, I am unworthy. He's getting a right view of himself. He's getting a, 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 a right view of himself. He's unworthy, and yet God is worthy, and God is merciful. Um, he says, look, I, I went into this country. Now I've come back with two bands. I mean, it's rags to riches now. I have all this stuff, men servants, maid servants, four wives, 12 boys, and many girls, and all this stuff I've gained. You've, you know, God has did what he told him he would do. He would provide for him. And now he's leaning upon God in prayer. But at the same time, he's like you and me. Yeah, I've prayed, but guess what else I'm doing? I'm, I'm getting a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C ready. Um, I'm going to divide my, my, my band into two groups if the first group goes and he attacks the first group, the second group will escape. But even more so, after he affirms God's covenant, he prays very specific and definite. Okay, verse 11. He doesn't beat around the bush. There's no time. Here's his prayer, short and sweet. Deliver me. Save me. Short and sweet prayer. It's not colorful. It's just what he needs right there. And so we see a pattern that we, could, we should acknowledge as well in our prayer life. God, you have said this. You said you're a father unto me. You have said uh, that you, we would ask and, you, and we would receive. You said that um, you would provide for your children. Here am I. I'm yours. You promised to provide, reminding God of his word. And that's what he does in this prayer. But at the same time, He's got the plan A, plan B, and plan C. It's either total dependence on God and, you know, some crafty stuff that I'm going to arrange on my own. So there's that balance here of, about God's part and our part being showed in, in front of us. So here are some prayer principles just from this story right here. It should include affirmation or adoration about the, the covenant, God's promise, His word. Two, it should include a self-humbling. As he says there, I'm not worthy. Verse 10, I'm not worthy of all your mercies and of all your truth. There is a spirit of humility and dependence there. Another prayer principle that uh, we don't like, but is the reality. Our personal fears, our dire circumstances, our difficult times... God uses to bring us to a place of brokenness and dependence. That's what's happening here. Do you remember the story of Hezekiah and the Assyrians? Uh, Rabak, Rabaksha is, is just cursing them. For, and they, they've, they've seized Jerusalem. He's cursing them. He sends a letter to the king, and he says, this is what's going to happen, boom, boom, boom. Hezekiah receives the letter, and uh, you know what? He's got a whole kingdom to feed, and now everything's going to be cut off. What does Hezekiah do? He takes the letter, he goes to the temple, lays it all out before the Lord. That's what circumstances should lead us to do. And it should be the first thing, not the last. Okay? So that's another principle that we draw out of this. And then it should, prayer should include praying back God's word or promises as he did here. And... Um, here, we have to be careful not to lean on human, human methods or human aids. This is what he's doing. He's, 
He's, uh, what he does, look at the next page, or next verse, verse 13, Genesis 32, 13. If you were to underline the word presence, if you got a King James, if you were to underline the word presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S, you'll find the word present four times in the next um, seven verses, or eight verses. Verse 13, after he hears the bad news, he divides his family, and, and he lodged there that same night and took of that which came to his hand a present for Esau, his brother. 200 she-goats, 20 he-goats, 200 ewes, and 20 rams, 30 milk camels with their colts, 40 kine, 10 bulls, 20 she-asses, and 10 foals. And he delivered them into the hand of his servants, every drove by themselves, and said unto his servants, Pass over before me, and put a space betwixt drove and drove. And he commanded the foremost, saying, When Esau my brother meeteth thee, and asketh thee, saying, Whose art thou, and whither goest thou, and whose art these before thee? Then thou shalt say, They be thy servant Jacob's. It is a present sent unto my lord Esau. And behold, also he is behind us. And so he commanded the second and the third, and all that followed the drove, saying, On this manner shall ye speak unto Esau when ye find him. And say ye moreover, Behold, thy servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goeth before me, and afterward I will see his face. Peradventure he will accept of me. So went the present over before him, and himself lodged that night in the company. So here, this is the plan. Servants, you're the first group. You take these, these bunch of groups, I mean, these bunch of gifts, tell them what I told you you say. You second group, here's a bunch of gifts, here's a bunch of animals. When you see them, give them the presents. Tell them what, you know, what you're supposed to say. The third group, so he's trying to appease, he's trying to bribe Esau's anger and rage. Oh, okay, wow, he gave us a present. Oh, maybe he's not so bad. Oh, another set of presents. And I, I got 400 men to feed. Oh, that's not so bad. This is going to be nice. Oh, I got another set of, of livestock. This is great. This is what he's thinking. He is going to buy his brother's forgiveness, or at least bribe his way back in to family. So, you know what? Three, you know, three installment plans. <laughs> buy, buy, buy. And he's, he's back, to, back, to, back to brotherly love. But that's just not how things work. He reminds again, you know, this is, this is like us. He reminds God of his promises, and then he acts as though God didn't speak. Right? I know what God has said, but. I know the angels were here, but. You know? Um, Warren Wearsby said it this way, This is the conduct of a believer who needed to be broken before God. He prayed to be delivered, way back in verse 11, but his greatest need was to be delivered from himself. Okay, remember, a, a natural leader has, has the ability to get things done, but then he starts depending on himself rather than God. And that's what's happening with Jacob here. Let's look at verse 22. So he's by himself. Look what it says. And he rose up that night and took his two wives and his two men, women servants and eleven sons and passed over the, jor, the, the four Jabbok. By the way, the word Jabbok means he will empty. And he took them sent them over the brook and sent over that he had. And Jacob was left alone. Okay, there's, there's something about aloneness. Okay, a lot of people don't like aloneness. But aloneness is where perhaps you can hear the voice of God best. And so he's alone here. And look what it says next. And there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint, and he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. And he said in him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince... Has thou power with God and with men, and has prevailed? And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask, ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, 
for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And as he passed over Penuel, the sun rose upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. He limped. Therefore the children of Israel eat not of the sinew which shrank, which is upon the hollow of the thigh unto this day, because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh in the sinew that shrank. So we have a power struggle here. He sends his, his, his wives and children over. He's left alone. Um, we see this word wrestle before. Okay? His wife, Jacob's wife, Rachel, back in Genesis 30, verse 8, says, I have wrestled with my sister and wrestled in prayer. And now he is wrestling with a man in the dark, and this man is none other than a theophany, uh, a pre-incarnate picture of Christ. And it is, it, is, it is when he's alone and he knows there's going to be a showdown the next day with a brother who's, who wants revenge. At least that's what he thinks. And then all of a sudden, God comes to him. Okay, sometimes a Preachers and pastors will preach, you need to go pray like, like Jacob. Jacob didn't go out to pray that night. Jacob was just alone and God came to him. And so there's a wrestling match. Jacob is maintaining the upper hand. He's winning. But I think here's a point where... Uh, His name is going to be changed. Here's a point where a proud, can-do man, he can get things done. He acknowledges his name. What's your name? And he says, Jacob. What does Jacob mean? Deceiver, deceiver heel grabber. He tells God, I'm a deceiver. That's who I am. He is honest. And when he's honest... And broken, God gives him a new name. How many people has God given new names in the Bible? We have who? Sarah, Abraham, Jacob, Israel, Peter, right? Simon, right? Saul, okay. I think, I think Saul, that wasn't given by him. I think that was his natural Greek name. But, but um, Saul was a, a, a metropolitan guy. He had a Hebrew name and a Greek name. I think he used his Greek name when he was witnessing to the Gentiles, but, um, which is Paul. But um, here we have God changing character. Abraham, you're going to be father of nations. Sarai, you're going to be mother of many. Jacob, you finally acknowledged you're a deceiver. But you've laid hold of me and not let me go. And I'm going to touch you so that you will always remember that you need to lean on me. He would never walk the same. Remember what he was afraid of? I'm going to give all these gifts. I'm going to see if my brother's face changes. He doesn't see the change of the face of Esau. He sees the face of God, and then he changes. All right, so um, let me just give you some um, New Testament pictures of this, this idea of wrestling. And by the way, um, in this passage in, in, in Genesis... It's just the facts, right? I think uh, Moses just says, here, this is what happened with him. Turn to Hosea. Turn to the book of Hosea, chapter 12. Hosea makes a comment on what happened with, with Jacob and the one he was wrestling with. He was wrestling with God. But Hosea, chapter 12. Everybody there? It's, it's the minor prophets towards the end of the Old Testament. Hosea chapter 12, in verse 2, here is God's comment on Jacob's wrestling. Everybody there? 
All right, here we go. I'm going to read Hosea chapter 12. Just to let you know that prayer is conversational with God, but is also emotional. Hosea chapter 12, verse 2. Here is the prophet Hosea speaking. He says, The Lord has also a controversy with Judah and will punish Jacob according to his ways. According to his doings will he recompense him. In other words, you're going to reap what you sow. You're going to get punished for your evil, right? Verse 3. He took his brother by the heel in the womb, and by his strength he had power with God. So here, here's a picture of what we just read about. Hosea is, is making a, a, he's preaching about what happened with Jacob in the, in the wrestling match. Verse 4. Yea, he had power over the angel and prevailed. He wept and made supplication unto him. Sometimes prayer involves deep emotion. And here Jacob is described by Hosea the prophet as weeping deeply. It is emotional. It is, it is physical. You know, he endured. He wept and he made supplication. He prayed. Let's go on there. It says, He found him in Bethel and there he spake with us. Here is something interesting. Hosea is, is an exa, a prophet of the exile. This is when they've been, they've been kicked out or about to be kicked out of, of the land. And he's saying, when God spoke to Jacob at Bethel, he spoke to us. The family of the blood Jews, but also the family of faith, Abraham's faith. We are of Abraham's faith. So Hosea is saying he spoke to us when he spoke to Jacob. And Jacob, when he prayed, he wept and he prayed and he made supplication. And so anyway, just to get back to the the wrestling with God here, Jacob wrestled with God. He wrestled with the angel. He sought God's favor. Can you think of a New Testament verse that talks about wrestling? New Testament verse that talks about wrestling. I'll give you a hint. Ephesians chapter 6, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers. And um, I'll read it to you. Ephesians 6 verse 11, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I'll skip a couple of verses, then he goes to verse 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance. There's the connection. Wrestling, prayer, perseverance. He wrestled for God's will, and that's what we do when we pray. We wrestle in the spiritual realm for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And when we're wrestling with God in prayer, we are actually opposing Satan. It's a battle. It's a spiritual battle. And so Jacob calls the place when he's done Peniel, which means the face of God. I have seen God's face and lived. And when, when he leaves, he'll never be the same again. His limp will be a picture of his, of his, of his uh, wrestling with God for the rest of his life. Okay, when you meet God, your walk should be different right? There should be a change. And so metaphorically, that's the picture here. This, this uh, trial, this struggle made his faith more perfect, and uh, his limp would be a constant reminder that God's in control and not him. God changed Esau's face, not the presence. It was God that made the difference. So Jacob turned a, a corner in his life here. That's why he got the new name. And for practical application for us here, we have to wrestle with God in order to receive his blessing. And this is, how, this is how it happened. He got alone with God. No more distractions. He got alone with God. He was hungry for God. I will not let you go until you bless me. 
getting alone with God, getting hungry for God, and then he was broken by God. He was honest with himself. I'm a deceiver. Okay, you acknowledged it. Now I'm going to touch your thigh. You know, I'm going to touch you, and you're not going to be able to walk the same. This is to remind you that I'm in control, and you need to depend on me for your whole life, not on yourself. So he was broken so that he could be blessed. And so he was blessed with new, a new character and a new walk with God. So let's, let's uh, think about this as we uh, pray this evening. God allows us to wrestle in prayer so that can we, our faith can develop more fully. Um, God uses physical disabilities to create spiritual dependency on him. The Apostle Paul in the New Testament, in 1 Corinthians 12, he said this. This is a paradox. I don't think the world understands it. Christians understand it better. But this is what Paul said in, in 2 Corinthians 12. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the, the, flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So here we have Paul learning the same thing that Jacob did. In his weakness, he found power with God. From weakness came strength. Doesn't make sense in the human realm, but God's grace makes it sufficient for us to handle all that we need to handle. All right, so let's go ahead and go into prayer this evening, and let's share some prayer requests. If you look at